Okay, great. Well, uh, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity and thank you very much for uh, organizing uh, this conference uh, in the honor of Danny. Um, I, I'm not gonna say any, any, uh, anything about uh, his uh, gigantic math contribution because I'm sure that uh, some people will do it much better than me. Uh, I want to just say a few words about his huge interest contribution in my life because he had uh, two uh, awesome uh, students, Riddhi Shah and Nimesh Shah. One was my collaborator, one was my colleague at some point at Ohio State. And uh, he also has a daughter, Pallavi Dani, who's a, a friend and a collaborator. Uh, and so I've known him most through indirect uh, uh, indirectly more than uh, directly, but uh, he also contributed a lot to, uh, to a very nice uh, working ambient at TIFR that I profited a lot in my youth and that I'm seeing less of right now uh, because I don't know, I don't travel so much anymore. Um, okay, so let me just uh, start my talk. It's always a bit odd to give a talk without having seen the, without seeing the audience and having some feedback. Uh, so anyway, if you want to interrupt me, please feel free to do so. Um, otherwise, I'll just start. So I'm going to talk about uh, actions on Delta median spaces. So um, I have a plan for the talk. First, I'm going to uh, define medians, Delta median spaces and give some examples. I'm going to also um, give a conjecture and some evidences for this conjecture and some known cases. So when I was younger, I used to, uh, to start my talks by giving a result that I had proven. And uh, now I will mainly base my talk around the conjecture that I would like to prove and some explanation on why I think this conjecture is interesting and, uh, and uh, why it should be true. So, um, so the, the focus of my talk is going to be delta median spaces. So what's a delta median space? I have a geodesic metric space. So meaning that uh, each time I take two points at distance D, uh, then I can find an isometry on the, from, the, from the segment to, uh, to joining X to Y. And uh, this, this is the interval between X and Y. And uh, so in many space, like in Riemannian geometry, many times the, or in Euclidean geometry, the interval many times is a line or deformed to a line if the space is uniquely geodesic. But uh, I, will, um, I will not assume that. In fact, I will have spaces that are non-uniquely geodesic. Um, right, so I'm going to uh, take delta intervals. So here you have the intervals. You can see that those are the points that are on a geodesic between X and Y. And if I'm looking at delta intervals, you're not exactly on a geodesic. You, you're off a geodesic, but not by much, by some, by some by some uniformly bounded delta. And if delta is equal to zero, it's the usual interval. Right, so nothing very difficult here. Um, I'll start with a, with a definition of a type of metric spaces that have been studying quite a bit those past years. And those are median spaces. So I'm, and I'm going to do everything in terms of geodesic metric spaces. I could do it in uh, metric spaces that are not exactly geodesic, that are little holes in it, but not too big, but it becomes te technical and not, not very, it doesn't add anything that interesting. So I'm just gonna stick to geodesic metric spaces. But uh, if you want some, exercise and technicity, you can probably uh, write everything in what people call weekly geodesic metric spaces. So anyway, what I want, I'm gonna say that a, metrics, a geodesic metric space is median. If each time you take three points, 
you have the, the triple interval between those, 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 two, those three points, they all intersect in a single point. So uh, what's the first example? But it's R with the usual distance. And you can see that the interval between X and Y is this thing here, between Y and Z is this other thing here, and Z and X is this thing here, and you have this point, which is a triple intersection. The, the second example is R2, the Euclidean plane, but not with the Euclidean metric. So yeah, it's the Euclidean plane with, not the, with, with the L1 metric. And, uh, and here you can see that if you take the L1 metric, you have this, this the interval is, or the intervals are basically rectangles. And uh, here you have your triple point intersecting everything. Uh, the other example are trees and trees will come back uh, quite a bit in my talk. Um, and here you can see, you can really see this, uh, this triple intersection uh, on a point. And uh, as I said, one that's not an example of median space is R2 with the Euclidean norm, because then the intervals are just, just those one, those lines and you have no triple intersection. So really what we want is a triple intersection for any three points of the set of geodesic. You could think of it as uh, metric spaces so that you have some kind of tripod between any three points. But this tripod, but, but, but yeah, in a, in a non-unique sort of way. So now I'm going to, I promised delta median space. So uh, let's throw in a delta in here. And I did put it in red, uh, the delta I throw in. So here I recall it's the delta interval. Uh, and I'm gonna pick a delta greater than zero. And now my space is delta median. Each, each time I take three points, I want the triple intersection to be at a uh, uniformly bounded Hausdorff distance to a point. And so, yeah, so, so that, that's me trying to write this definition as similarly as possible as the definition of median space. Here, I'm going to say that this implies that this, this, this implies that uh, the triple intersection is non-empty, uh, but this is really a convention. I'm saying that the distance, uh, the Hausdorff distance uh, from the empty set to anything is infinite. So anyway, uh, right, so delta median. So that means that I want the triple intersection to be non-empty and uniformly bounded in terms of delta and not in terms of uh, X, Y, Z. So what do we have as examples? Median spaces that we just saw, they're zero median. And uh, symmetric spaces associated to rank one Lie groups, or uh, more generally, so here, here, I, here I made the example of H2, the hyperbolic plane. But this will work for any Gromov hyperbolic space and also all symmetric or rank one symmetric spaces. And here you can see the H2, and I did it for three points that are on the boundary. Uh, it works even better if the three points are inside. And uh, here you can even compute the you can even compute the the C and the delta. Uh, here you can see those uh, those three neighborhoods of uh, the triangle, and you have this non empty triple in intersection. Uh, if delta is large enough, if you if you take delta is equal to zero, you have an empty triple intersection, and that's not work. But if you have delta, if you take delta large enough, then you will have an unempty triple intersection. All right. Uh, so, but but this is where this is where we we leave hyperbolicity because then you have products. But uh, the metric you put is the sum of the two metrics. And you can do the same with products of uh, complex hyperbolic or quaternionic hyperbolic. And uh, one thing that's not 
delta median is symmetric spaces associated to higher rank Lie groups like SL3R, for instance. Uh, right, yeah. So I think I go, I, I'm going to come back to, to why uh, SL3R cannot be delta median or the symmetric space associated to, to SL3R will not, well, admit a, a, a delta median metric. So in itself with the, with the, with the symmetric distance, it will not be delta median because it will contain those Euclidean plane and it's uniquely geodesic, so it's no, no chance. But we could imagine that you can, as you do it with H2 cross H2, you're not putting a symmetric distance, you're just putting the sum of the distance, which is not the distance, the metric you get from the symmetric space. All right, so plan for the talk. I gave you some definitions and examples, and I guess now I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you the conjecture, a conjecture and evidences for this conjecture. So this is the conjecture. Uh, if you have a finally generated group, this is what I think, and then I'll tell you why I think that. Uh, it will act properly by isometry on a uniformly locally finite delta median space, if and only if it acts properly by a fine isometry on some LP space. So this is a this is a this is some Banach space for P that. Uh, oh yeah. So so I guess I should say uh, P strictly less than infinity. Because uh, if you allow p infinity, p equals to infinity, I think there is a result that says that any group, uh, any final degenerated group can act on uh, L, L infinity. So that's not going to be interesting. Uh, and, and here is a probably equivalent conjecture. And that maybe if you know property t, if you know cast down property t, that'll be a little bit closer to. Uh, to, to think you, you think about. Uh, so you have a finally generated group and it, it'll it, and it, it won't admit any action on a uniformly locally finite delta median space. So has bounded orbit for any action. It's it's equivalent to saying that you can't act. Uh, if and only if it can't act on any LP spaces. So that's some kind of a strong property T. Property T can be thought of as any action on a Hilbert space has a fixed point. And here it's a stronger version where we say that any action on some LP space has a fixed point. So why uh, uniformly locally finite? So uniformly locally finite is means that the balls intersected with uniform nets have uniformly bounded cardinality. So typically, typically, if you think of uh, discrete isometry of, of a manifold, uh, you need to control the, you need to control on a negatively curved manifold, you need to control the curvature and, and the entropy somehow. Um, but here, here I'm going to, so, so basically what I want to avoid is something like this. Here, see here you see you have balls with not many elements, and if you go here, the same ball, the ball with the same radius, will have more and more any elements. So this is typically something that I like like to avoid, or something locally infinite, is something I like to avoid. And I'll tell you later why I need to avoid that. It's not that I want to avoid it; it's that I have to avoid it. Otherwise, it's everything is wrong. Okay. So uh, this I, I gave you the conjecture, and let me let me just uh, give you some uh, evidences now. So the status of this conjecture and what are the evidences? Um, it was uh, it, it, it was known that among hyperbolic groups, some have property T and some don't. And uh, for those who have property T. Um, some people already showed. I mean, if you if you if you if you don't have property T, people knew that you could find a proper action on a Hilbert space, on an L two. And uh, but if you have property T, all those people, well, you know, one after the other, in, until uh, Guoliang Yu is the first one who got like a complete result 
but Alvarez and Lafort ga gave a self-contained complete result, meaning they don't rely on anybody. So they show that if G acts properly and by isometry on a uniformly locally finite delta hyperbolic space, then G acts on LP of G cross G for P large enough. And uh, so hyperbolicity, I, I won't redefine, just think of H2 and thin triangle. And, uh, and so that's, that's one piece of the conjecture. So, so delta hyperbolic are a special class of delta median. So this is a special class of delta median. It's a good thing I, I wrote in advance because my handwriting is bad when I'm live. So the other, the other, um, the other evidence is work that I did with uh, Cornelia Jurtu and Frederick Haglund some, whoa, 15 years ago. Um, we showed that you get a proper action on a median space in if and only if you get a proper action on a Hilbert space. And uh, it's the same as any action on a bisometry on a median space has bounded orbit to say that G has cash down property T. So I guess, yeah, I'm not gonna go, I, I, I wasn't planning in, on defining property T because I'll focus on proper actions. And I will talk about a little bit on how you get those, uh, those actions. Uh, right. Okay, so um, yes, yes. And uh, so this, in, in the negative part of the conjecture, we have a result by Thomas Hetel, who says that lattices in higher rank simple group cannot act on a delta median space without a bounded orbit. And, uh, and uh, Bader, Furman, Gellander, Monod, uh, say that the same lattices, the one in higher rank simple A groups, cannot act on an LP space without fixed point. So those are all indices that should tell you that the conjecture is correct. And so, yeah, what happened with SL3R? So this is my understanding of SL3R. This is my geometric understanding of SL3R. It's actually not SL3R, it's SL3 modulo SO3R. So, my, my geometric understanding, so it's a space that has some dimension, what, five or something? Yeah, five. But so, so, it's, so I can't draw a dimension five space, but I know that there is a bunch of pieces that uh, have uh, dimension two, and those are flats, and they're here. The flats are here. And, uh, and you have a bunch of them, and they're kind of, uh, they're not glued together. They kind of travel together very closely for a while, and then suddenly bloop, they diverge. Uh, you know, in kind of a hyperbolic way. And, uh, and, uh, and what governs their divergence in this hyperbolic way is the root system. And the root system, even if you try to modify the Euclidean metric on the flats, the root system will prevent you from modifying it in a way that will give you delta median. I mean, if you want to have delta median, you need to put some kind of L1 metric on the flats and, uh, and, and the root system will not allow you to do that, basically. All right. And so the reason why I'm interested in this conjecture is uh, because of this open question, which is about mapping class group. So there are several open questions uh, if they have property T. So this question has had a solution at some point saying that they don't have property T. Solution is in the archive, but it's widely, is widely uh, believed to be false. Even though, so, so, so somebody claims that mapping class group, no, they don't have property T, but People agree now that the proof on archive is probably wrong, it's most likely wrong, but they still believe that it should not have property T. So one equivalent definition of having property T is uh, that any action in a Hilbert space has a fixed point, 
So if you are an extremist and want to go very far away from fixed points, you ask for proper action on a Hilbert space. But this is a difficult question. And if you want to be maybe uh, more, um, more modest, you can, want, you can allow yourself not only a Hilbert space, but some LP space, which is a Banach space, a little more general than a Hilbert space. Um, and it will not settle the property T question but it would still give you some information. So this is, a, this is my picture of the mapping class group. So it's homeomorphism of, uh, of a surface modulo, uh, the ones that are different topic to the identity. Anyway, the, I, I, I won't need the group. I, I won't need, I'm, I'm not gonna need anything about the mapping class group. The only thing that I'm going to need about the mapping class group is those reasoned results. Um, the reasoned results is mainly Harry Petit, but he uses Besbina, Bronberg, Fujiwara's uh, machinery. And altogether, we know that mapping class group act properly by isometry on a uniformly locally finite delta median space. Um, right. So here is why I'm so interested in this conjecture. And uh, and then I'll tell you, yeah, this is why I'm so interested. Uh, this is why I'm interested in this conjecture. Okay, all right. So see, I have several, I have several uh, parts of my talk. Uh, so uh, this is, yeah, this is, so I, I, I gave you delta median spaces, definition ex and examples. And I gave you a conjecture in evidences. And now I think I'm going to some known cases. Oh, no, I didn't want that view. Okay, so this is the baby case. It's the baby case. Uh, it's the, it's the, I shouldn't call it baby case because it's, it, was a, it was a difficult result by uh, by Hagerup in the in the seventies, but you know, we start to understand it well enough that it looks e easy. Anyway, so now I'm going to start with G that acts properly in a tree, and I want to build an action on a Hilbert space. So this is where I'm actually going to explain some math that that, that might be of some use. So what's a What's an action on a Hilbert space? Uh, it's just this map from G cross H to H, such that alpha G is in a finite isometry of H. And we know uh, that a finite isometry, they decompose as a unitary part and a co-cycle part. So this is a, this is a unitary part. This is a unitary representation, and uh, this is what we call the co-cycle. And uh, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what it is. Basically, so so, right. So your 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 action is going to take G and it's going to map it somewhere. It's going to move it somewhere. This alpha G is going to move all your spaces somewhere, but in particular, it's going to take G and and uh, X and map it to alpha G X. And the fact that it's proper, it means that, so X is in, uh, is in your Hilbert space. And so you're going to compute the, the, the norm of the difference. And this norm, you, this difference, this norm of this difference needs to go to infinity when G goes to infinity. And I have a, I have a, I have a countable group because I, my groups are always countable and it's bad, but, my groups are either countably countable because they're finely generated or they're SLNR. <laughs> but anyway, the, so, uh, so what, what, yeah, so what does it mean to go to infinity uh, in, in, in a discrete group? Uh, you can just, either you say that it leaves every finite subset or you can say that it goes to the one point compactification 
uh, because you can always one point compactify something that's locally compact. Okay, so uh, great. So in fact, this alpha G is because of this because of because of this decomposition, you have that alpha G of X has a unitary part, which is which is here. Unitary part. And this uh, this 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 co cycle part here, which is so I'm I'm not gonna write the I I wasn't planning on writing the the formula first because if I do it without preparing it I'll get it wrong every other time, and then and then the only thing the only the the only thing that you need to know this one co cycle is just it's what's going to make this thing an action. Is going to yeah, it's what 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 makes this thing an action. So basically, if you write it down and want alpha g h to be alpha g of alpha h, you're going to get your the relation that b of g needs to satisfy. But b of g really is just a map from g to h, and uh, and and you want the norm of it to go to infinity when g goes to infinity. So this is the map that we're going to build in the case where you have a you have a tree. So uh, here I'm going to take a base point, uh, right? Here is my base point. And, uh, and I'm going to define a map that, uh, that is on, on T Chris T. And it's a map that uh, points to the base point. So this is what, it, so it's a, so you, you take a pair you take a pair and you're going to say that it's one if the edge if if this is an edge that points to the base point and zero otherwise and uh and this is definitely not in l2 of t cross t because it's uh well it's one on an infinite set so that cannot be summable so it's but it's in l infinity so it's not so bad and i have a picture oh why why is that Anyway, I have a picture of this map. Um, yeah, I have a picture of this map. All right. Okay, that's the picture of the map. So basically, here I have my base point, and uh, and I can. I'm just if a pair is not an edge. Is going to the value is going to be zero. If the edge points that direction, it's going to be zero. But if the edge points to that direction, then you then you do one. Okay, so that's that's my my picture of this map. And it's always pointing to the base point. And so if you move the base point, so here I move the base point here, and I I do this one that points to the base point, and I and I subtract the one that points to the move base point, then, then it starts to belong to, uh, to L2 because here, here everything cancels. And again, whatever is not on the geodesic cancel, the only place where those two maps differ are on the geodesic between between my base point and the image of the base point. And when G goes to infinity, if the action is proper, then this this interval, the length will go to infinity. So the norm of this thing will go to infinity. And this is this is this is how you get your proper action. Uh, all right. Here I have an animation. Let's see if that works. Okay. Yeah. I think that works. So basically, this animation is telling you that uh, when you have your uh, when you have your you, you have your 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 psi your your psi base points minus the one that's moved. Um, when you do when you subtract everything that's not on the geodesic cancel out, and the only thing you need to know is really this geodesic. How what's happened on the geodesic between the two points? 
Okay, so it means that uh, uh, if you kind of uh, hold your tree with your two hands, you can forget about everything else. Okay, so what, four, yeah. So this is another example, uh, and it's a CAD zero cube complex. This is another object that I like very much. So it's it's built out of cube, and uh, and you might recognize, I think, PGL2Z. But anyway, so those are those are those are three dimensional cubes. These are two dimensional cubes. And uh, and what, what I'm going to explain is why when you have a proper action on such an object, you get a proper action on a Hilbert space. Just it's the same proof as we did for the tree. This is actually almost a tree. So, uh, right, the uh, cat zero cube complexes have a notion of half spaces. So you can you can cut your your complex in two pieces using using the notion of half spaces so here i'm i'm building those those half spaces that cut your complex in two pieces and you can see that there's a there's a there's quite a bit of them but finitely many locally between any two points you have only finitely many separating so here i'm building uh, i'm building all the half spaces right so here here I, I have all my half spaces and I'm picking a base point. And now my map, remember I, I had the map on my tree pointing to my base point and my map was on T cross T. Now my map is on the half spaces. It's on the set of half spaces and it's pointing to my base point. So, uh, right. So my map points to the base point is one. If you're in the half space is zero otherwise. And you can see that it's in L infinity of the half spaces because it's it's one and an infinite set. It's definitely not L2, but again, if you look at the difference between those two maps, they will only differ on the on the half spaces separating them, and they're only finitely in, in fact finitely supported. Right, okay. Um, I did number four, I need number five. Okay, so uh, let me just tell you more. Uh, so we, we saw, we saw, um, we saw the, the tree case in sort of the CAD zero cube complex case, even though the one that I show you was a hyperbolic one. So, so it's not that enlightening. Uh, so, so let me just uh, give you more um, give you more uh, known cases. So, rank one and product of rank one groups. Um, that's a th those are this is this is this is a, this is a, th those are those are well known re results that you can probably find in. Uh, uh, I'm going to mess up the attributions here. So let's uh, let's say that it's uh, it's 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 relative well, well known. All the people who worked on that have permanent jobs. So so it's so okay. So so I won't hurt them too much if I'm if I if I if I don't know exactly who did what. But anyway, uh, those have property T. Those don't, and they actually find a. You can you, you can make them act properly on a Hilbert space and on a median space. Um, this one they have property T. They can't act on a Hilbert space, but they act on a median space. And uh, and uh, and and a similar proof as for the tree will work. And this is what I want to show you. So I think of H two, and again I'm going to take a base point. And now I'm going to take all the vectors pointing to this base point. By the way, this, this, proof, this proof that I'm going to give you that uh, SL2R acts properly in a Hilbert space, it's morally correct, but it's probably technically not that correct. I mean, it's, but it's definitely morally correct. Anyway, it's a talk, so I, I don't have to go to the details. Okay, so, and it's going to be exactly the same proof as, as, 
as uh, as as we did before. So we have this base point, and we're in H two, so we have a tangent space. And at each point, we can point towards this base point. And if I think in terms of a, of a group, I would I would have a I would have say a lattice. Then I would just be on the points of the lattice, and everything will be uniformly locally finite as as I wanted. And again, I take base point and I move the base point, and I look at this map. The map that points towards towards the base point is definitely not summable of any kind. But if I if I if I subtract it, something similar as in the tree will happen. Basically, if you're outside, if you're if you if you're if you're on the delta this 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 delta interval, if you're if you're if you're on an interval kind of not too far from from your interval. Uh, here is here is the interval. You're in, it's uniquely geodesic. So if you're if you're not too far from the interval, the 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 at this point the the two the two pointing vector will differ by almost two because they'll they'll point the pointing will be different. But because of thin triangle, when you go far enough, your your vector your vector is almost the same. They're, they're all, almost the same as if, if, you're, if you're far enough. And this is, this is because of thin triangles. It's the, when, you, when you point, whether you point to, to here or you point to here, in fact, you're, not do, you're, you're, you're totally not doing that. What you're doing is, is this and this and something, something very close. Right, so 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 then the same the same moral proof as, as in the tree will work, except that it requires more work, but that's the same idea uh, with more work. That whenever whenever you're kind of in between this this base point and the translate of the base point, uh, the value of this difference is going to be almost two because you have a vector pointing that direction, a vector pointing that direction, and when you when you subtract them, you have something more. And uh, so, and and when you go far away, they're very small. And if you're on a uniform net, you can you can sum them, you can p sum them, and and that will converge. You need to your p might not be two. If you do like this, your p might not be two because in fact what you what you see is when you go far, uh, when you when you're here the difference between the two vectors is like a exponential minus the distance to, to, this, to this geodesic. And uh, so that's why you need uniformly locally finite so you can have a P that, that, beats, the, that beats the exponential growth you're summing up. And, uh, but, but then each time you're, you're, you're more or less near this, this, delta, this delta interval, uh, this will be like two, and it will grow like the distance between between uh, your base point and the image of the base point, and that goes to infinity when uh, when g goes to infinity. Great, and so so with um, so Alvarez and Laforgue, they extended this idea to, uh, to, to any, any hyperbolic group. And in order to do that, they construct some kind of tangent vector using a flow on uniformly locally finite hyperbolic graph. And uh, with my collaborator, Damani, Etel, and Legre, we rephrase everything in terms of tangent bundle on a metric space. And uh, and so uh, with moderate success, I have to say, the success is not great uh, in the sense that we have some not very interesting uh, extension of uh, of some group acting on an LP space. Uh, but the point was, but but really, what we were after is the conjecture I told you. 
So, um, so here's, here's, here's the notion of tangent space. On, a, on, any, on any metric space. So I, I have a nice enough measure and uh, I want a polar space Tx with a Borel map. And I want that uh, the fiber is a Banach space and I want a measurable map that to two points assign a vector pointing to, towards one of the two points. Uh, so that's not very enlightening. So I probably drew some pictures. Did I not draw pictures? Where are my pictures? Oh, there should be pictures. Yeah, yeah, there'll be pictures. Okay, so, so and, uh, and my tangent space is negatively curved if, if the difference between two vectors are like an exponential in terms of... Uh, in terms of the distance between uh, between uh, the base point of the vector and where you're pointing, and I also have a notion of proper, meaning that you want to see uh, you, you want you want to see distances between two points. Here, I have a picture. I I, I prefer pictures. <laughs> I like pictures, as you see. Okay, so basically here I have my metric space. And uh, I, want, I want to put a Banach space on top of every point. And uh, so that's going to be basically my tangent space. And uh, negative curvature, the negative curvature here is exactly what I was telling you, is that if I point, if, I, if I'm somewhere and I point towards two points that are not too far away, but pretty far from the place you point from, uh, this, this should be small in terms of the distance, in terms of this distance. So like an exponential minus uh, this distance. And uh, in properness, properness means really that you want this tangent vector to point in opposite direction when you're, when you're in the, we're in, in the, the geodesic uh, between two points. And uh, yeah, so, um, great. I think I'm missing a. You, you, so yeah, what I, I guess. Um, right. Oh, I just noticed that I'm missing a piece. Um, I'm missing a piece of uh, what I wanted to say. First, yes, uh, uniformly locally finite is important in general because Minasian and Osin produce groups that have fixed point on any for any isometric action on an LP space, but admit some effect action on a quasi-tree, and a quasi-tree is a metric space that is, that is quasi-isometric to a tree, so not necessarily Uh, uniformly or or even locally finite. Right. Um, okay. And so, uh, what do you? Do? I can see that I'm earlier than I thought, and I'm actually missing a piece of my talk. Um, right. So so. So if you have, a, so, so with a tangent space, with, with a negatively curved tangent space, which is also proper and G equivariant. So here, here I have G acting on, on my metric space XD. Um, G equivariant is 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 what you think it is. So I have my I have my my tangent space. I have my tangent space, and if I move it around, uh, I have I have my x here. Uh, this is my, and here here I have my tangent space a x. And what I'm saying is that if I move it around somewhere 
to GA and GX, I want the image of this, I want the image of this vector to be this vector. So that's equivariance. And, uh, and so if you have a, if you have a, if you have a negatively curved tangent space, um, then you get a proper action on LP with the exact, with, okay, the exact same idea. The exact same idea, you take, uh, you take this function that points to a base point and, uh, and then you, you subtract it with the function that points to the move base point. And then uh, if you have a uniform locally finiteness, you can, this is a technicality that will make your, your, your thing work. And, and, and you get your action on LP space. Um, and uh, if I go back to the conjecture, what's missing, so the, the negatively curved tangent space is something you can build. Uh, well, it's, I showed you how it looked like for, uh, for a tree. Um, it's what you think it is uh, for, for a manifold and uh, for an arbitrary hyperbolic graph, uh, what you, for an arbitrary hyperbolic graph, um, the way the way people did it, the way Alvarez and Lafargue did it, they they took delta neighborhoods, and then and then they they kind of had a flow process that uh, that 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 took this point and here the, you you put the uniform measure and then you then again you 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 just spread out the measure until you get to here, and here you have like a small measure. Uh, on a small ball around A that's going to point to the direction where you're going. And uh, right, so, so but what's missing now to get the full conjecture is uh, to try and uh, to, 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 to understand how you can, uh, you can use this idea of, uh, of negatively curved tangent space and uh, adapt it with, uh, with the half space ideas um, that I showed you on the CAD zero cube complex, but uh, wait, this is uh, this is oops, this, this is not done yet, and I hope that we'll do it. And I guess this is all I wanted to say for today. I, I stopped a little bit early. Thank you for your attention, and I'll be happy to answer to your question if you have any. Uh, any questions? Uh, uh, Ma'am, uh, could you please yes. explain again the definition of uh, uniform locally finiteness? Okay, so uniform local finiteness. Uh, um, Uh, uniformly locally finite. So I don't want to assume my space to be uh, to be locally finite. So okay, it, uh, so um, so X D is a metric space. I'm going to say that it's uniformly locally finite if for any Y contained in X, D, a uniform net. So a uniform net is uh, a subset, a discrete subset So here I have X and here I have my discrete subset and I'm saying it's a uniform net if the distance between any two points is at least some uh, some epsilon, and uh, and that's so. So if the distance between y and y prime 
is greater or equal to epsilon for all y, y prime in, in y. And the distance between x and capital Y is less than or equal to delta for any X in X. So it means that each time I'm somewhere else, I'm not too far from Y. And then, and so I'm gonna say that X is uniformly locally finite. Each, each time I take a uniform that, so it's something that kind of approximates X uh, uniformly. Uh, the ball of radius R centered anywhere, intersect y, this has cardinality bounded by a constant depending on r only and not on where you are. So I don't want, what I don't want to happen is that a ball here has not many points and then I, re, and I, I ball of radius say five has not too many points. And then, and then if, I, if I displace the ball, it's going to get more and more points. So for instance, the, the, the picture I drew was this one. It's, it's Z and I add more and more edges. So it means that here I have a ball of radius two that, that does, if you, if you take a one uniform net, you will see that you have maybe four or five points. And then if I go here with my same ball of radius two, I can have arbitrarily many points. Yes, sir. thanks a lot. But each time you have like a some co-compact group action, that doesn't happen. But I, I didn't want to assume any co-compactness. So just, yeah. Thank you. Any more questions? Uh, hello, Indira. Uh, Hi. Hi. So I kind of missed the point uh, about these conjectures. Can you uh, tell me how far, like, what all do you know about these two conjectures that you stated? Uh, I, I, I don't know that much. It's kind of uh, wishful thinking, I guess. Um, so this. Those are the conjectures that are here. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Yeah, what, what, what we know is that if, if the, if, uh, so, uh, if, uh, if, if, if G acts on a delta hyperbolic space, uniformly locally finite, then, then G, acts, G acts on some LP. And, uh, and, uh, and also the conjecture is true if you put zero median and, uh, and, and P is equal to two. So for zero median, we know that median proper action on median space is, is the same thing as proper action on a Hilbert space. That's that's yeah that that's that's oh, some work I, I did some long time ago. Um, and so so we know that this is the same. And uh, we also know that uh, and, and so that's Hager Hager result is really what started everything. Uh, he showed that if you act on a tree, then you get your action on the Hilbert space. And then, and then, uh, and then people were thinking that oh, instead of a tree, if you have any hyperbolic space, would that work? And then immediately, people are no, you can't because some hyperbolic groups have property T, so you can't hope for a Hilbert space every time. But then, uh, I, I guess. I guess people knew that lattices in SPN1 could act on some LP. They would get the LP from a LP function on the boundary. And so they knew that for, for SPN1, I guess. Um, 
and then and then once you have like the complete conjecture the, the complete use result that says that if you have this when once you have this this use the result by u then um then uh then you start thinking that oh maybe it would be nice to have the whole thing when when the delta median space is not hyperbolic but maybe it's uh it's something more complicated that uh, delta hyperbolic space the second conjecture can you just show the second can you show the second conjecture oh the second conjecture the probably equivalent conjecture <laughs> <laughs> but see here you are saying that this uh, the part uh, is supposed to show you strong relative strong property t so can you yeah. at least uh, uh, say that it has property t or no uh, no, it's not going to, yeah, it's kind of a little off property T because uh, uh, you have, uh, oh, no, what I, so you say that if you have, uh, you're asking if you have a finally generated group that has fixed point property and any delta median space, would that force property T? I yeah, yeah, because it, it would force to have uh, fixed point property for zero median spaces, and that's property T. And it would have exponential growth, these groups, or? Uh... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, yeah, that'll force exponential growth. If you have polynomial growth, then... if you have polynomial growth, then you get a proper action. Yeah, so this is, that, this is something, that's something that I totally don't understand. <laughs> that I, that's something that's something rather mysterious to me. So if you have polynomial growth, you get amenability, mm. and out of amenability, you get an action, you get a proper action on a Hilbert space, and out of that, you get a proper action on a median space. Mm. And I don't know how those look like. Like the, all the rest, they have kind of a vague idea of of, of how how geometrically things look like, but for the case of, uh, I mean, I understand the case Z to the N or R to the N, but I should have prepared the, the nil put in case I don't understand. <laughs> I, I think you get an action on a median space, but the action is not co-compact. And, uh, and, 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 and I don't have a good vision. I don't, I don't have a good vision of the median space, yeah. Yeah, but certainly if, if you conjecture these, then some of these properties from top have to uh, fail, right? So. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. In the in, yeah, in the in the in the case of uh, yeah, in the case of uh, uh, in the case of uh, of uh, nilpotent groups and polynomial growth, uh, you it's true, it's true, and you get your your median space. And I never understood how it looks like. <laughs> you get out of uh, like an algebraic construction. Yeah, and I keep thinking that I should try and understand how this action looks like. And uh, but I I I I feel that I you know as soon as you have uh, some distortion, like I, I stop seeing what happens. <laughs> yeah, but it's unique, and maybe this is your baby too. Yeah, maybe. The <laughs> yeah, I, I think. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that if, I, yeah, I keep thinking that if I understood this baby case, that would be, that would be enlightening somehow. Okay, thank you. Nice. Thank you.